Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good to see you again. Thank you. Another beautiful day in paradise on the beautiful, elegant Westerdam. But so many of you are leaving tomorrow. You're leaving before the party's over. We're, sh we're sure going to miss you, though. Uh, so glad that we had the chance to, to get together with you. <clears throat> I appreciate the, the many kind comments that uh, Marianne and I have received. And um, for those of you who, uh, for whom the lectures are a very important part of your cruise experience, I hope that you'll find a meaningful way to provide that kind of feedback to the Holland America line so that perhaps uh, going into the future, as far as we can see that lectures will still be a part of your cruise experience. I have really, thank you very much, thank you. We have so much enjoyed meeting so many individuals. And the other night, as we were sitting at dinner, uh, Marianne and I uh, met Lon and Patty from the Seattle area. And uh, somehow the conversation turned to the fact that at this point in our lives, we're beginning to buy things that perhaps we wouldn't have bought earlier. Uh, we justify them by, by perhaps thinking, well, this may be the, the last pair of cowboy boots that I'm going to buy. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, fill in the blanks. And uh, we got to talking about cars. And Lon said that he had, within the last year or so, bought a Camaro ZL1. 580 horsepower. 0 to 60 in 3.8 seconds. And that reminded me of a story I heard recently. An older gentleman drove out of a Chevrolet dealership in southern Florida in a brand new Corvette convertible. And as he started driving I-95 north, he opened it up a little bit. And before he knew it, 80 miles an hour. And then he heard the siren. And then he looked in his rearview mirror, and there were the flashing lights. And he floored it. <laughs> 90 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, 110. And then he thought, what are you doing, you old fool? Pull over before you kill yourself. So he pulled over to the side of the road. And the uh, state trooper walked up to his car and said, uh, Sir, it's 30 minutes before the end of my shift. It's Friday afternoon. And if you can give me a reason I haven't heard before for going as fast as you are going, I'll let you off without a ticket. And the older gentleman said, Well, officer, years ago, my wife ran off with a state trooper. and I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> Thank you. That is a good one, isn't it? Okay, well, um, today we're going to be talking about the children of the sun, the Inca. You'll recall that earlier in the cruise we had a lecture on the Maya, the 3,000-year civilization from 1500 B.C. to 1500 A.D. And then we talked about the Aztec, a much uh, shorter in duration um, time period of 1427 to 1521. And you can see them denoted in the, uh, the map in the upper left-hand corner. And today we're talking about the Inca down in South America. Interesting that the dates are so close to those of the Aztecs within a decade in terms of the rise of the empire and within a decade almost the fall of the Inca Empire. Now, before the Incas came along, there were many other civilizations in Peru. Some of you might have seen uh, these Nazca lines. They're called the Nazca Lines. They were created by a, a civilization that lived 100 to 200 AD. There drawn on the floor of the desert of southwestern Peru. And these pictures were taken hundreds of feet in the air. 
So it's really quite a, an interesting phenomenon what they did. And then other civilizations uh, along the coast, they used adobe as their building material. And this is a picture, by the way, my wife and I spent most of last November in Peru. And so a lot of these pictures, including that one, uh, my wife took them. And we had a wonderful experience and we saw the largest adobe building in history. The largest adobe city in history is along the coast there as well. And when we were in one of the museums in Lima, we saw this exhibit, and it, it may be a little bit hard for you to read. Uh, the timeline is on the far left-hand side, and the regions are across the top. Let me use my laser pointer. The regions of Peru are across the top. And these are all of the different civilizations that preceded the Inca, but the Inca were the only civilization that flourished in all of what we call modern-day Peru. The Inca dynasty, the name Inca refers to the ruler. It was like king or emperor. And so these are the different Incas, the different dynastic rulers of the Inca empire. One thing about the, the Incas is that the the transition of power was not as, as clean and simple as the European model where a crown prince was prepared to take over the throne when his, his mother or father died. In the Inca uh, way of doing things, any member of the royal family could become the ruler. And the determination as to who was the most capable was made by members of the, of the uh, ruling family. And as you might imagine, this led to assassinations and civil wars, and every time that there was a change of dynasty from one ruler to another, it was a time of great turmoil and bloodshed in the Inca Empire. I'm not gonna be talking about uh, these, all of these different individuals except for two of them, Pachacuti and Atahualpa. I'll tell you more about them in just a moment. A little bit more about these Inca. When they died, they were mummified very, very carefully. And it was believed that they were continuing to live, but just in a slightly different stage of, of life. They, the, the estates that they had created while they were alive, they continued to be owned by the deceased Incas. They were often, whenever there were major decisions of state to be made, they would bring out all of the mummies and sit them in a circle and have a discussion with them to determine what should be done. Interesting, I don't know how that worked. But, uh, and then they would, from time to time, the, the mummies would go to visit their relatives as well. Um, very, very interesting uh, concept. While we were in Cusco, outside of Cusco, we saw this particular slab of stone. And this is where some of those Inca were mummified. They would take the body and stretch them out on the stone, remove their internal organs, and over a period of time, the body uh, would become desiccated and mummified. And it was a very cool temperature. We put our hands on this stone, and it was cold to the touch. So it was perfect for the process of mummifying the Inca. Pachacuti. The name means earth shaker in Quechua. Quechua is the ancient language of the Inca. And it's still spoken throughout Peru in, in the uh, rural areas. He was really the, the one who started the whole process of expanding the empire. He set up a, a, a constitution of Inca laws. The taxation system, he established that. And he is the one who expanded the empire through strategic alliances, marriages, and family, um, and military raids. Um, one thing, they did not like to go to war. As we'll see in a moment, they had a very large army. But the preferred way of expanding the empire was to send messengers to the other Indian groups and to persuade them that it was in their best interest to join the empire. They would become materially more rich if they uh, pacified, if they, uh, in a peaceful way, became subject to the Inca empire. And so it was through persuasion, through bribery, 
and sometimes intimidation, ultimately conquest that the Inca Empire expanded. Now, the heart of the Inca Empire was in the Cusco Valley, and it's that red circle right there. In 1438, that was where all of the Inca were located. And over a period of time, they expanded the empire to become the largest pre-Columbian empire, the largest in terms of distance from one end of the empire to the other. The Aztecs had approximately 20 million people in their empire, the Inca only 10. But their empire extended from a corner of Colombia down through most of Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and part of Argentina as well. It was a massive empire, the largest in the New World before Columbus came. Now, as I indicated a moment ago, they did have armies at their disposal, as large as 140,000. They were very excellent warriors. They had the latest technology in terms of, of uh, the various weapons that they used, but they preferred very much to peacefully take into the empire other, other Indian peoples who were on their borders. The empire was so large that they divided it into four regions called Suyus. And as you can see, there were four Suyus, a northern one, an eastern, western, and southern Suyu. And they all came together right there at that corner in the center of the Inca Empire, Cusco. Now you'll notice I have three different spellings of that word here. The first one, Cusco, is the phonetic spelling of the Quechua word for Cusco. They did not have a written language, unlike the Maya. So this was a, a phonetic spelling. On maps, on photos, and, and the various trip, uh, uh, various travel literature, you'll see it spelled this way. The Peruvian government is encouraging the changing of the spellings to the phonetic Quechua spelling. At any rate, it was the capital of the Inca Empire. It was laid out in the form of a puma in the far left-hand picture there. It was not a capital city in the normal sense of the word because a lot of people did not live there. It was more of a ceremonial center and a location for the royal family and the, and the nobility to live, but the common people were not within the uh, city limits of Cusco. This is what it looks like today. And the very center of the empire was the Plaza de Armas. That's a, a Spanish name. And, and most of the cities in Peru have a plaza called the Plaza de Armas. It's the, the, the main plaza in the city. And right there in the center of that plaza is where those four corners touched of the four different regions. Now, you can imagine having an empire that was so widespread, 3,700 miles along the spine of the Andes, from Quito, Ecuador in the north to Mendoza, Argentina in the south. It was an amazing distance. Fortunately, and through by, uh, by design as well, they had a road system that was really quite remarkable. By the way, many of those roads were already in existence and the Inca improved them. <clears throat> 25,000 miles of road surface and 25% of them are still in existence and many of them are still being used today. As you go through Peru, you'll see these zigzag marks all over the place. It's a very mountainous country, as you can imagine. Those are the roads as high as 16,000 feet above sea level, back and forth, back and forth. These are pictures that were taken along the coast. As you can see, the, the, uh, in some cases, were paved with stones three to 13 feet wide. Being th going through the mountains, they had to bridge chasms and they used rope bridges for that purpose. And the bridges were so fragile that every year they had to rebuild the bridge and refurbish it. 
wherever there was a rope bridge in the Inca Empire, there was a village nearby, and the whole purpose of that village was to keep that bridge open and safe. It was a capital offense to use the imperial highways for personal business. It was restricted only to government business. So you can see the, the roads are just magnificent, just magnificent. They used those roads to stay in touch with the far-flung corners of the empire. And there were runners called chasqui who were located approximately every mile. Young men who, were, who uh, were in effect with their labor paying taxes. So a certain number of months of the year, they would, they would uh, be stationed next to the road. Someone would come running through and they would pass the message or whatever it was that they were carrying onto that runner and he would run to the next station. And in that fashion, they could transmit a message 150 miles in one day, if you can imagine that. A remarkable form of communication. <clears throat> the roads were used to move the Inca army. And, of course, they were very narrow. I, I showed you a slide a moment ago, 3 to 13 feet in width. And there were bottlenecks, as you might imagine, at many points on the roads. And a large army of, uh, say, uh, 15 or 20,000 people, it might take them three or four days in order to get through the bottleneck because it was such a narrow, constricted passage. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Inca economy, and that is tied very closely to this road system. It was a remarkable economy in that it was almost entirely socialistic. There was no market system, no money, no merchants. The ruling elite, the family of the Inca and other nobles, owned everything. The government controlled all kinds of production, distribution, and use of commodities. So in other words, it was a very, very centralized, socialistic government. Two types of commodities were created by the Inca government. Luxury items, first of all. Again, they used bribery to expand their control over other tribes and other peoples. And so they would give to the regional rulers, to, to the rulers of these nations that they were seeking to, to uh, take into the empire, they would give them such beautiful things as, as that feathered cloak over there. Shells, in particular, were of great value. These are spondylus shells. They are only found off the coast of Ecuador in 40 feet of water. And so a, uh, there was a dedicated operation to bringing those shells up, and then they were used as special gifts for the individuals who were, they were trying to influence to try and keep them loyal to the empire. And of course, gold and silver. They were wonderful goldsmiths and created some wonderful things. These are pictures that, that we took in, in a number of the uh, museums that we visited. Textiles. It was the most beautiful art form that the Inca used. They were just perfectly creative in, in the various ways that they used the textiles. The source of the, of the yarn and thread that they used were the alpaca. I'll tell you a little bit more about the alpaca in just a minute. A small animal that had very, very fine, um, fine fur and, and they would herd them and shear them and wash the wool and so forth, spin the, spin the yarn. Cotton also was used, but more primarily for the common people, for the garments that they used. But as you can see, it's just beautiful. And some of the clothing was indicative of the rank of the individual. That tunic on the far left would not have been worn by a common person. It would have been worn by someone who was very important in the hierarchy of the Inca Empire. These are some pictures that we took as we traveled throughout the country. They make the yarn the same way. 
You'll notice in the uh, hands of the individuals on the left that there's a sort of a, a little spool kind of a thing there. And everywhere you go in the country, whenever you see a native person, a woman, who is perhaps selling things by the roadside, she'll be working on her yarn, creating the, the, the basic uh, mat raw material of the textiles that they would be creating. And over here, the yarn would be dyed, and there were all kinds of, of plant-based dyes and insect-based dyes as well that created the most vivid colors. The colors were just magnificent. They used a, a backstrap loom, which the, it's a very nice loom in, in that you can set it up anywhere. Just tie the end of the loom to some kind of a stationary uh, structure and lean, put the, the loop around you and lean back and that creates tension and then she can send the shuttle back and forth to create the beautiful textiles. They did not, as I mentioned a moment ago, they did not have a writing system. And consequently, they had to have some way of keeping track of the transactions, keeping records and so forth. And they used this remarkable method called kipu. Kipu in Quechua means knot. And so it was by a series of knots, knotted strings, that they were able to create records. These are the only records that we have today of the Inca Empire. And depending upon the number of turns in the knot, the color and direction of the twist, um, and how it was attached to the top or the bottom, that indicated the information that needed to be conveyed. And this one was the most magnificent one that we saw. As you can see, it's exceedingly complex. They used kipus to record inventor inventories, harvests, and to record census information. Now, those... I've been talking about the luxury items, the gold, the silver, the textiles, the shells, and so forth. The other form of commodity were the staples. Again, it was a very socialistic society, and people would spend a great deal of their time working for the government, providing labor for the, uh, for the growth of, of agricultural uh, crops, for the creation of textiles, and so forth. So food, tools, and raw materials were those items that were created by the common laborers. They were stored in st warehouses. Warehouses were scattered all over the country in large numbers. And that way, whenever there was need, if an individual needed something, they'd go to the local warehouse and they would get food or clothing or tools or whatever it was that they needed. It's a beautiful system because if there was famine in one part of the empire, storehouses in another part of the empire, uh, items were taken out of those storehouses and sent to the other part of the empire that needed uh, those particular commodities. These are pictures of the storehouses, some of the storehouses that we saw. As you can see, they're made of, of um, stones, and the Spaniards were just amazed when they arrived. There are storehouses full of textiles, wools, arms, metal, clothes, and so forth. Things grown and made in their land. They were just astounded. They'd never seen warehouses like this in Europe. Many of the warehouses were high up on the mountainside. And as we traveled around the country, we, we were thinking, why would they put a storehouse so high up on the mountainside? It would take so much work to get whatever it was they were storing up there or to bring it back down. And I asked someone about that, and they indicated that by putting them high up on the mountainside like that, the, the f uh, various food commodities that were stored there were well-preserved because... Up there, it was much cooler. The winds blew through and kept things dry and kept those foods uh, from um, deteriorating. And so that is why they put their warehouses for food way up high on the sides of mountains. <coughs> now, this is a very mountainous country. And they had to grow their crops on the sides of mountains. They created a form of terraced agriculture that is 
totally beyond anything else in the world. And even today, driving around the country, you will see on the sides of virtually every steep incline, you will see the remnants of the terraces that the Inca used to grow their crops. Just totally remarkable. They had a very excellent system of terracing. They'd start with a solid rock foundation, and then the next level would be gravel and sand to promote drainage. And then finally, at the very top, they would bring in the topsoil that the plants needed in order to grow. Now, as you can imagine, having terraces up on the sides of mountains, it was important that they have a source of water to get to be able to uh, make sure that the crops were well watered. And so, whoops, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Before I tell you about the aqueducts, this is an agricultural research station. At least that's what people think it is. The name of this location is Moray. It's outside of Cusco. And archaeologists believe that this was, they created microclimates with each one of these levels. In fact, there's a 27 degree Fahrenheit difference between the top level and the bottom level. And they, therefore, they could experiment with different kinds of crops growing at different elevations. They were able to, to uh, create an environment where they were, uh, were able to do a lot of agricultural research. Now, the aqueducts. Most remarkable. They would run for miles and they would be so perfectly inclined that the water would run from the source to the destination without any hindrance. The aqueducts are still being used today by the people in Peru. They're just remarkable how advanced these individuals, the Inca Empire, was in terms of its building of engineering marvels such as these aqueducts. Now, as far as the crops that the Inca grew, you can see them listed here. Various fruits and ro vegetables, roots and tubers, legumes and grains and so forth. Some of them we grow yet today. Others we uh, do not grow, and perhaps I, I believe some of them have been lost to our modern day. But quinoa is a very, very important grain that has in recent years become very popular because of its nutritional value. You'll notice other items such as berries and, and papayas and b peppers and beans and so forth. But the most important crop of all were the potatoes, which are right there, the roots and tubers. I'll tell you more about potatoes in just a minute. These are pictures of the market in Cusco. As you can see, the volcanic soil is still providing a wonderful bounty. All kinds of fruits and vegetables of many, many different varieties, many of them grown since the time of the ancient Inca Empire. Potatoes. More than 200 varieties of potatoes. They were the real staple of the, uh, the food system of the Incas. They originated in southern Peru, approximately in this region right here, uh, close to Lake Titicaca. And they were the staple of the empire. A form of potato called chuño, and there's a picture of it on the right here, is a dehydrated potato that could last for 10 years. And so they would harvest them. They would, uh, at the first frost, they would step on them and squash them and they would become frozen a little bit and then they would dehydrate and they could be eaten for up to 10 years. And that was the fuel that enabled the Inca army to travel long distances, potatoes. They grew coca leaves and still do today. It was revered as a sacred and magical kind of crop and therefore it was not abused and in fact, uh, it was used then and now to lessen hunger and pain and enable people to, to continue to work under the most difficult conditions. As we were driving past a, a road crew of individuals in, in Peru, uh, we noticed that they were chewing 
the coca leaves. They put a little bit of alkaloid substance in their cheeks, such as ash. That activates the uh, ingredient in the coca leaves that then enables those individuals to work uh, longer without being hungry, and it provides a very mild stimula stimulative effect such as a, a cup of coffee. It's not a, uh, a major uh, high. It's not addictive by any means. They found water flowing out of the mountain that was highly saline, and they created salt-gathering pools. They are still in use today. These pools are, each one of those plots is owned by a different family. And many of those plots have been in the families for generations and generations. We talked about domesticated animals when we talked about the Maya and how there were only four animals that the Maya domesticated. The turkey, the Muscovy duck, dogs and doves. The Inca also domesticated animals, three animals, total of seven in the entire New World. On the left, you'll see guinea pigs. My wife took that picture as we were visiting the, the humble home of, of a, a, a Peruvian, and they have the run of the house. They're all over the place. You had to be very careful where you stepped because they were just scurrying around under, underfoot. And they raised those, generally speaking, for the restaurant market. The, uh, and they do eat them on occasion, but only very, very special occasions, such as marriages. But they sell them to restaurants, and a, they, they're called kui. And they are on the menus of many of the restaurants in Peru. I did not eat one, but uh, I understand they sort of taste a little bit like chicken. <laughs> you know, any strange food, people say, well, it tastes like chicken. Um, and then on, on the right here, we have alpaca and llamas. The alpaca, as I mentioned a few moments ago, are the, the wool of the, of the alpaca is the source of the finest uh, textiles that in, in Peru. And then on the right, the llama. The llama was the only draft animal in the entire New World. It could carry as much as 70 pounds on its back. And therefore, it was a very, very important animal in the Inca army. In fact, it was the jeep, K-ration, and fatigues of the Inca army because not only did it carry things, the flesh was eaten, and also the skin was used for clothing. So that was the very, very, very important animal in the Inca empire. The Inca religion, I've listed a few of the uh, deities that were worshipped by the Inca. They didn't have nearly as many as the Aztecs or the Maya. The greatest god of all was the sun god, Inti. And a lot of the, the temples and buildings and, and uh, magnificent structures were dedicated to Inti. The code, the religious code of the Inca, do not steal, do not lie, do not be lazy, and do not do anything easy. And that last one, as you'll see in a few pictures in just a minute, they made some of the, the, the labor that went into creating the, the Inca Empire, the roads, the terraced uh, agricultural uh, structures, the aqueducts, and so forth, the buildings that we'll look at in just a minute, just an amazing amount of labor. So they truly did live by the code of do not do anything easy. <clears throat> and those who were obedient to that code, after they, they left this earth, went to the sun's warmth to live forever there. And those who did not live by the code spent the rest of their eternal days in the cold earth. In the mythology of the Inca, there were three spheres of existence. The upper world, represented by the condor, a very, very important animal in the mythology of the Incas, soaring high above the land. Machu Picchu was symbolic of the upper world, the world of men. The puma was the animal that symbolized the world of men. And as you'll remember, I mentioned a moment ago, Cusco was built in the shape of a puma. And so the city that symbolized the world of men was Cusco. And then finally, the underworld represented by the snake 
and near Cusco, between Cusco and Machu Picchu, is a valley called the Sacred Valley, and that, that really was where many of the Inca lived. That is representative of the underworld. Mountains were very, very sacred to the Inca. They believed that the mountains determined the weather, they determined whether the crops would grow, whether the domesticated animals would reproduce, and so it was on the mountains that sacrifice took place. Now we talked about, when we were when, uh, in the lecture on the Aztecs and the Maya, we talked about how sacrifice was a very common phenomenon in those cultures, particularly the Aztecs. It was a very rare thing for the Inca. But when they would sacrifice a person, it was usually a child or children because they were considered to be the most pure and consequently the most uh, appropriate to offer to the gods. This is a picture of a mountain in northwestern Argentina. And it was on that mountain in 1999 that archaeologists discovered three mummified corpses of children. And this 15-year-old girl was found there, so perfectly preserved by the combination of the cold temperature, the winds, and the sun, that it almost looked like she had gone to sleep earlier that day, the day that they found her. Well, the Spaniards heard about this empire to the south. Francisco Pizarro. He actually was one of the members of Balboa's party when he crossed the isthmus and, and uh, saw the Pacific Ocean for the first time. He later became the mayor of Panama Viejo, the capital of Panama. And it was while he was serving as the mayor of Panama City that he heard these rumors about a, an empire to the south. And so he decided to set off on an expedition. And in 1524, he sailed down the coast, got as far as Colombia, or what current day Colombia anyway, and it was a disaster. Starvation, death, they turned around and it didn't find any gold or anything. But he was a very persistent individual and he decided that they would need to give it another try. And let me back up just a little bit. In 1526, two years later, he sailed again to down the coast. And when they reached this island, the individuals with him mutinied. And he drew a line in the sand, and this is what he told his companions, friends and comrades, on that side, referring to the south, our toil, hunger, nakedness, the drenching storm, desertion, and death. On this side, referring to the north, the direction from whence they had come, ease and pleasure. Choose each man what best becomes a brave Castilian. For my part, I go south. And he stepped across the line. And only 13 other people stepped across with him. You think after such a, a stirring speech that his men would have all said, we're with you. Most of them turned around and said, see you later. And so he proceeded with the remaining, those 13 men on down the coast, sailing down the coast. They didn't find anything of interest or value until one day they intercepted a seagoing barge that was loaded with the treasures of the Inca Empire, the gold, the silver, the textiles, all of the, the very valuable uh, luxury items that the Inca used to, uh, to pay off the, the different officials. And with that, they intercepted it and they seized it and sailed back to Panama. Pizarro went to Spain to convince the king and queen that he needed their support to mount a major expedition to explore further. Coincidentally, while he was in the royal courts, Cortez was also there, having come there from the conquest of Mexico. He encouraged Pizarro to continue his quest, to continue his effort to uh, learn more about this empire and perhaps to conquer it as well. 
And so with the support of the crown, Pizarro sailed back to Panama and mounted his third expedition in 1531. And it's denoted by this green line right here. And as you can see, this time they went on shore and they worked their way down the coast until they reached a place called Cajamarca in current day Peru. He had 62 horsemen and 106 foot soldiers. Not a large group at all. The timing was absolutely perfect. Atahualpa, who was the Inca at the time, had just beaten his uh, brother in a civil war and he and his 80,000 person army were resting at Cajamarca. Smallpox had made its way south from Central America where it had been introduced inadvertently by the Spaniards and it had spread throughout the empire and consequently the empire was not as strong at that point as it had been some years earlier. So these two different things happening at approximately the same point in time really made it a lot easier for Pizarro to proceed with his conquest of the Inca Empire. He lured Atahualpa into a narrow plaza surrounded by buildings. He hid his army, such as it was, in the buildings around the plaza. A priest gave Atahualpa a Bible. When Atahualpa threw the Bible on the ground, Pizarro and his men commenced the slaughter of the warriors surrounding Atahualpa. They took Atahualpa captive. Does this sound familiar? After all, he had been talking to Cortez. It was the same pattern. Seize the ruler. They did that. And they told Atahualpa, in order for us to free you, you are going to have to give us a ransom. This is the building that they used for the ransom. The Atahualpa was required within two months to fill half of this building with gold and then the equivalent of this entire building twice over with silver. The word went out throughout the empire, bring gold and silver here to ransom our Inca. 11 tons of gold and 22 tons of silver were bought. The Spaniards had nine furnaces going 24 hours a day to melt all of that gold and silver down into ingots. And what a, what a terrible thing that was because so many of the treasures of the empire were melted into bullion and gold uh, bars and, and so forth and sent back to Spain. Now, Atahualpa had fulfilled his part of the bargain, but the Spaniards did not fulfill their part of the bargain. Pizarro found him guilty after a mock trial of revolting against Spain, practicing idolatry and murdering his brother. And he was going to burn him at the stake. That absolutely horrified Atahualpa because in their belief system, if a body was burned, it could never ascend to the higher levels. And so he pleaded with Pizarro, please don't burn me at the stake. And Pizarro said, okay, I won't burn you at the stake if you will convert to Christianity, which Atahualpa did. And in fact, he, he was baptized and given the name of Atahualpa Pizarro. In other words, he took on the name of Pizarro. And at that point, he was strangled. So he did not die in the fashion that he uh, most feared, but he, did, he was killed by the Spaniards. So fast, at that point in time, the Spaniards had taken the head of the empire and eliminated it. They s established a puppet ruler and spread their influence throughout the empire. So let's move to, to what Peru looks like today, what the Inca Empire looks like today. This is current day Cusco. It's a beautiful, beautiful city to visit. The stonework in the city is just magnificent. In fact, 
they revered stone almost as much as gold. And they were master stone workers. So you can see those stones fit so very, very closely together. They would spend a long period of time chipping it and sanding it and putting it in place and, and readjusting things. And one of the most remarkable stones is this one right here. It's called the 12 angle stone. As we were walking through the streets of, of Cusco, we came upon this stone and people come from all over the world to see it. Every little angle is perfectly fitted against the stone next to it. And you cannot even put a knife blade between the stones. They were master stone workers. Just outside of Cusco is a place called Sasque, Sas, Saxehuemen. It was a magnificent structure. In fact, the largest structure of interlocking stones in the entire Western Hemisphere. What made it even more remarkable that it took a long time to build, and not only that, but the quarry was so far away, and there were valleys between Saxehuemen and the quarry. And those stones, some as large as 100 tons, had to make their way from the quarry to Saxon women. Again, remember, don't do anything easy. They really lived by that code. It, it's a remarkable structure. Koricancha was the temple of the sun god, Inti. It's, it was located in Cusco, as you might imagine. And this is a, a scale model in uh, on the site where Coricancha was located. It was really, really quite remarkable. In fact, the Spaniards, when they saw it, uh, told of the splendor that was beyond belief. Um, it boasted an ornamental garden where everything, the clods of dirt, the maize plants, the corn cobs, were fashioned from silver and gold. It was the most wonderful and grand thing that they had ever seen. Totally remarkable. And as you might imagine, the Spaniards tore it down and built a church on top of it, the Church of Santo Domingo. They did that as a way of, in, of discouraging pagan worship and encouraging uh, worship of, of the Christian faith. The only remnant that is in place now is the original wall of Coricancha. Over the years, there have been multiple earthquakes in this area and the church of Santo Domingo has been badly damaged many times. The wall has not been damaged at all. Ollante Tambo, on the way from Cusco to Machu Picchu, is this wonderful uh, location called Ollante Tambo. As you can see, it's just tremendous in terms of scope, in terms of the, the architecture, the use of the stones, just totally remarkable. And then Machu Picchu. Of course, we need to talk about Machu Picchu. That was on our bucket list. And we came to Machu Picchu. It was a beautiful day. It was discovered by a, an archaeologist by the name of Hiram Bingham. Of course, the locals knew about it all along, that up on high on the mountains on a saddle between two peaks was this old, ancient, hidden city of the Incas. He heard those stories, he climbed the mountain, and this is what he saw. Beautiful, beautiful sight. And these are pictures that were published in the National Geographic magazine that year. And this is a picture of Hiram Bingham. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I, I got the wrong picture there. Um, actually, that's Hiram up there. But Hiram was a professor of Latin American history at Yale University, and he was the model for Indiana Jones. These are pictures of Machu Picchu, just magnificent. If you are ever able to go there, we highly, highly recommend it. As you can see, there are uh, four-legged uh, lawnmowers who keep the grass short. And the most sacred place in Machu Picchu is called Inti Huatana. This is a hitching post, the sun's hitching post. They believed that by, in some wonderfully uh, sacred, symbolic way, if they had a hitching post, the sun would be tied to that hitching post and it would come back again 
rather than go away forever. Everyone, this concludes my last lecture. Of, for those of you disembarking tomorrow, it's been wonderful getting to know you. And I wish you a safe and peaceful journey home. And I hope that you'll take with you the, the memories of your experiences here on the wonderful ship, the Westerdam. And for those of you who are staying a little bit further, we're going to talk about pirates the first day out of San Diego. Thank you for coming. <laughs>